give a warm welcome to both Keith and Lauren. Well, thank you everybody for being here. I'm going to start off the softball question. Tell us a bit about yourself, about your life as a writer, and particularly, how do you um, balance this work as a writer and a professor? So the next thing, yes, 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 okay. So, um, the, I don't know that there's ever balance. I would say that it's more, you know what I mean? Like for all of us who do lots of things, it's, it's more like this than it's ever like this. Um, I like to write. So, so someone really obnoxious once said to me, well, if you liked to work out, you would make time to work out. And I was like, that's gross. I don't like to work out. I do it because I have to. But I like to write, so I make time to write. And it's not hard. I learned during the pandemic, actually. I used to think before the pandemic, before I was like living with dogs and kids and a husband in my house all the time, they didn't realize that they thought it was their house, it was my house, and I let them live there. And then suddenly they, they, they never left. But, before the pandemic, I thought, well, what I really need to write fiction is time and good lighting and quiet and coffee, right? You know what I mean? Maybe like a scented candle or something. But it turns out I don't need any of that. I need everyone to leave me alone for five to eight minutes, and then I can write a sentence. Or if I get 20 minutes, I can write two sentences, or a half hour, and I can maybe write a paragraph, and so on. And so making time is really for me a matter of ignoring my family and then in terms of doing everything else that's my job so i do my job um you know laundry will pile up occasionally although since i've uh, trained my husband to do it um and it still piles up and um i walk dogs a lot for both their you know their health and my own mental health and um and I just, I never feel good if I'm not doing something. That is not to say that every second of my time is spent doing something productive, like I do Wordle every day, but I try, every day there's a list of things I want to do, and most days I try to get as much of that done as I can. Do you write seven days a week? No, but I write, if I'm in a novel, five. But I'm not always in a novel. You know, but when I am writing, an, when I'm in a novel, like I'm very happy to be there, and I want to write as much as I can. Um, and even if it's frustrating or hard, like I like to just fidget or fuss with a sentence or two, and that that counts. I think that counts. And so, yeah, I would say five days a week, sometimes sometimes seven, but maybe maybe a day is really just ten minutes. So talk about talk about that a bit about writing a novel. I mean, for most of us in the room, we don't write novels, and so. What does that look like? What is that, I mean, where does it start? How long is the process? Things like that. So writers often talk about, there are two kinds of novelists. There are probably many, many, because there are many kinds of insane people, but there are many kinds of novelists. Um, there are what they call pantsers and plotters, and I am a plotter. A pantser is someone who writes by the seat of their pants. Elizabeth Gilbert is supposedly one of these people. Um, you know, they're, they're people who, who wait for the inspiration and they're just sort of writing and seeing where it goes. And that is not me. I like to have a story in my head. I write towards a final scene every time. And so I um, have a, a plot in mind and every day I chip away at that particular story. Now, I can be wrong and it turns out that a plot I thought was brilliant as I'm writing it, 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 it just won't work. It won't keep moving and then I have to make changes. But, but, you know, I think of a novel in a way as like in a massive cross-country trip. You wouldn't try to do that without a map. Uh, you can maybe get, a, get across town without a map. A short story you can do without a map. But, if, but a short story is a trip across town, but a novel is this like long, epic, collaborative thing. I can't pop imagine doing that without knowing where I'm going. So I have a little outline that I'm willing to change. I have lots of books because all my everything I've ever written requires a certain amount of research, so those books are sitting next to me, and I get going. So talk about this novel a bit. Tell us what it's about. Tell us how you got started with it and, and, and how you took this, uh, this journey. Sure. So in 2019, before the pandemic, my nephew, um, it was his bar mitzvah year. And uh, some of you, maybe many of you, have been to bar mitzvahs, the kind that are, you know, disco balls and past appetites, right? Like, you know, that's dancing in circles. My nephew was not that kind of kid, and the idea of having that many eyes on him he found frankly mortifying. What he thought would be interesting, and it, it was, 
was to go to Poland. Um, on both my family's sides, uh, my father's from the 1920s, my mother's from the 1880s and 90s, they both emigrated from, from Warsaw and the surrounding shtetls. Shtetls are small towns. But, you know, they, they came over in a less confessional time. Nobody was, like, sticking phones in their faces and telling them to tell their stories. And, of course, when they got here, all they wanted to do was walk away from the past and build a future. So they died and nobody really knew anything about where they had been, except there was this, maybe someone had sold fish. That was like as far as it got. So we get to Warsaw and we're really relying on our tour guide uh, to, to show us everything. This was my parents, the three of us, three middle generation, six kids who at that time ranged in age from one and a half to 13. And a very patient man named Adam and a, a van. And he took us all over, you know, we went to Krakow, we went to a, a shtetl, a former shtetl called Schmelnik. And uh, have any of you ever been to? to so Schmelnik, it was a shtetl. It was about 60% Jewish, maybe a little more. And uh, after the the Nazis, you know, partitioned Poland after 1939 with the Soviet Union, they took over Schmelnik. They they separated the three-year-olds from their parents. They they executed the children in front of their parents. And then they they put all the Jewish adults in the synagogue and set them on fire. And the the people who were remaining, right, the non-Jews never got over the wound of, of seeing what had happened to their neighbors, their trading partners, in some cases their friends, and they rebuilt the synagogue. It, of course, is a museum. There are no Jews left to, to worship there. And in the middle of the Chmielnik synagogue is a glass bima. The bima is a structure from which the rabbi or, or congregants will read from the Torah. And this glass bima, I don't know that there's another one like it in the world. And, and the children, these Jewish children, poured into the bima and took funny pictures in the glass structure and it was joyful and it was a moment of um, like healing is too strong but like almost redemption, right? So we did all these things that were, were moving and then by the end of it, again, kids one and a half to 13, we were very tired and so most of us, 10 of us, skittered off to go see the National Soccer Stadium and the adults among them to drink lots of vodka but four of us, my parents, my sister and I, went to this building at 35 Damascus Street. It was called the Jewish Historical Institute. And you walk in, so it did not feel appropriate to me to make the Jewish people, and this book is really very only about the Jewish people. I didn't really try to get into like the minds of the Nazis or the Polish gendarmes or anything. It was just the, the, the Jewish people there were good and bad because people are good and bad. And they made <coughs> good choices sometimes and bad choices sometimes because that's what human beings do. And I thought that the best way that I could bring dignity to these characters who are not based, on, who are not real people, but who are inspired, of course, by real people, was to allow them to have the full range of human expression. So that's what I really tried to do. Another theme that you captured, and I wonder how you even you got around to doing this, is that within the ghettos, um, you know, the families that, that survive any length of time became dependent on their children. And, and it's such a, in, in the way in which you depict the children in this, in this novel is, is, I think, really fun and brilliant and thoughtful. And I'm curious, how, how, did you, how did you come to that realization and decide, and talk about how you portray these children and kinds of things that you do? So I do not advise most writers to live with small children. Like, they really get in the way of the process. Do you know what I mean? Like, you just, you think you're doing something, you're like having like a very brilliant moment and then someone needs a sandwich and it's over. So, um, but one, one nice thing about living with children, which I've now done for 16 years, I have a 16 year old son and a nine year old daughter, and um, they, they're fun to watch, right? Like, they're, they're fun to observe. And many of the, the characteristics of the kids in my book came from kids, not just my own, but the kids, the friends, the kids that I know. Um, one kid, uh, and Adam is a teacher, the narrator, the protagonist of the book is a teacher, so he works with children all the time. He doesn't have any of his own. But the kids were very much based on sort of kids that I've met. There's one kid, he, he, Adam becomes an archivist. He's a sort of imaginary member of Onik Shabbat, and he interviews some of the kids, and a kid, he says, thank you for letting me interview you, and the kid's like, I, I didn't let you, you just did it. You know, they're, they're, the kids are sort of like, I guess we're here. Um, it was clear from the archive how reliant many of these, um, uh, the people that get a war on children. The Nazis only allowed approximately 200 calories in per day, I think 187 or something. What, you know, there were soup kitchens that helped feed the gap. The soup kitchens provide about 700 calories a day, more or less. But for any 
family that had any assets, a way to get more food or more resources was to send your kids out through the sewers or under the gates with their pockets full of your silverware or jewelry or grandma's silk dress or something, and they'd come back with potatoes or cabbage or bread or sometimes even meat. And uh, that was a vital part of the, the underground economy that kept people alive. Um, it was shameful to be dependent on your children. Um, it was terrifying to be, because children were shot, could be shot, were shot. Um, but it was a way to keep people alive. And, and so children became a vital, vital part of the lifeblood of the ghetto. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's smuggling, the role of smugglers in children and in professional criminals who actually you know, rose to the kind of higher echelons of society. So also for some of you who may know that uh, within, the, within the ghettos are these uh, entities called the Judenrat, the Jewish councils, and, and they're, they're the ones who have to carry out the dictates of the Nazis. So the Nazis are, have a forced labor system. They want X number of people per day. They have, to, um, they have to come up with these people. And then as they move to deportations, it's actually up to the Judenrat, the Jewish councils, to draw the list of who's going to be deported each day, the thousands of people or everybody. So you, you seem to have gotten into the mindset there as well of, of, of the, of the Judenrat and there, there's a dilemma, why don't you yeah. talk about that? So there's a guy, and um, Polish speakers in the crowd? Thank God, okay, so I'm about to butcher some Polish, enjoy it. Uh, there was a man named Adam Chernyakov, is that right? Chernyakov, yeah. Thank you, Whew. I've only been saying that for a year. Chernyakov, who was the head of the, the Yudenrat, he had been a prominent um, Jewish businessman before the establishment, uh, you know, before the, the Nazi invasion. He was tasked, and, and he was sort of, I, I think based on what I read, sort of, he was distrusted by all sides. People found him sort of irritating. He was known for walking around the ghetto with a cigar. I, you know, but, but in the end, um, he was tasked with shipping the, the orphans to Treblinka during something called the Gross Action, which started in July of um, 1942. And the, the Gross Action was when um, the, you know, the Nazis collected 6,000 souls a day from the ghetto and shipped them to Treblinka, where most of them were gassed upon arrival, and, and uh, Chernikov couldn't do it. He could not bring himself to do it, and so he took cyanide, and, and the Nazis found him in his office. But then, of course, someone else did it the next day. So, um, you know, being, a, being part of whatever the, the Jewish uh, power structure, I guess, was, was really just a way of buying time. It didn't really buy you safety. Uh, and most members of the Yudenrat, you know, like most people in the ghetto, did not make it out. So as a writer, you, you obviously are following your, your, your instincts, your leads, and where the story takes you. You have to make some decisions. And so I'm, I've got a couple questions about decision making along the way. Um, why center a love story in the middle of the Warsaw Ghetto? That's the driving force of the narrative, one of the driving force of the narrative. Well, there, there are two reasons. One sort of echoes what I said before, that, that, that Jews should be allowed the full range of expression. And part of that is, uh, actually, three reasons. So part of that is, is love and sex, and that's part of being human and, and something that victims are not always allowed to have, but felt important to me. So that's thing one. Thing two is it worked for the plot. I never, as I said before, like I write with plot in mind, and so every decision I make is based on telling a good story. And so in many ways, this was a jailbreak story, right? If the ghetto is a jail, the tension comes from like, will you escape jail? And here, the answer, I wanted the answer to be the thing that keeps people turning pages, like, is he gonna make it? So that was reason two, and a love story uh, provides you know, it provided a lot of ballast for the plot. And then reason three is because when we went to the Schindler factory in Krakow, there was a, a mock-up of a ghetto room, a ghetto apartment, and it had these sort of mannequins in there that were supposed to show, you know, a man and a woman and then another man and the woman, the idea being that people were really cramped. They were forced into apartments, and the, the text in this, in this room was something like, you can understand how people were so miserable being forced to live among other families, and so that's never happened. I mean, but I, because I'm, I, something's wrong with me, I looked at that and I was like, I wonder if. Well. Because of course it happened, right? Of course. Like most of the time they hated each other, but sometimes, I um, And I read, you know, b before the before the get before the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, you know, there there were people drank and had sex and to, you know, that, that again, the full range of human expression includes sex. And so it seemed to me not only helpful from a plot perspective, but also from a human perspective, that perhaps love could flourish under even these incredibly difficult conditions. Interesting. So really kind of 
technical question. Um, how, so the um, the woman in a love affair, Salo, right? Um, how come you chose that she was going to be from Auschwitz or Auschwitz? Because it's Auschwitz. So Auschwitz, Auschwitz, yeah. which I didn't know until I went there, uh, was uh, the, the reason it was Auschwitz was built in this place is because it was a Jewish town, you know, half Jewish. So you build it where the Jews are. It was in the east, right? You yeah. could ship people out, and then you, but you don't ship everybody out. I had read that there was a controversy about nuns building um, like a convent near the grounds or everything. And in my imagination, before I went to Auschwitz, I was like, oh, Auschwitz is very separate from everything else. Why would these nuns deliberately provoke people by building a convent there? Well, because it's a town. They were building a convent. I mean, perhaps a little tactless, but they were building a convent in a town. Auschwitzim is a town. And I thought it was such an incredible way to delineate the before and after, to turn Auschwitzim into Auschwitz. Tangentially, a question that I asked when I first learned, you know, I learned about the Holocaust in Hebrew school, I guess, uh, you know, and I asked a question that I've been asked again and again and again, which surprises me a little bit on tour, which is, why didn't they leave? Why did they stay? Why did they let themselves go into the ghetto? Why did they let themselves get herded like sheep? You know, people have actually sent me angry emails about that even, you know, that I was writing about Jews and turning them into sheep, along those lines. And the answer is, because there was a before and an after. And during the before time, Auschwitz was unimaginable. You could not imagine what would happen because it, something like that not only had never happened, but should never have happened. Human beings should never been shoved by the hundreds into gas chambers before. That should have remained unimaginable. And therefore, you do not run from what you cannot imagine. The history of Jews in Poland, as you well know, had been mostly peaceful with times of upheaval, but people persevered. These were communities that had been there for a thousand years. You do not run from the only place you know. I was just on the phone with a friend of mine whose lives are here, whose children's lives are here, who has a child who has been Gen, you know, her, her gender has been, she's been clearly trans from the day that she was born, or from the day she could express it. She's, they, they have to leave. And it is hard to leave. And they have resources that the Jews in Poland did not have. They have education, they can settle anywhere. But they're gonna have to leave in order to keep their child safe. And they are wrenched by it. And it is not a decision they are making lightly. And they are only making it because they know what will happen. But these Jews did not know what would happen. And so they did not leave. And I not only respect that, I know I would have made the same choice. The reason I called it Auschwitzim before it was Auschwitz is because there was a before. And it is really, really important for me to situate this novel in the time that came before. And I believe right now we are living in a time that is coming before. And that frightens me. So as a novelist, you have a certain responsibility to your story. And That's you're the only responsibility. What's that? The I find that the only response. Okay, so yeah. then you're writing historical fiction, so where does the responsibility of the story, when it confronts the historical narrative, is it an easy decision to make that you're going to follow the... the yeah. it is, that, uh, that made it much easier, actually. I've never written historical fiction before, but having history to hang the plot on made it... Like, on my desk was a history of events in the Warsaw Ghetto, like bullet points, and then I taped a history of like major events in World War II. So many things were interesting about that, including just how painfully long it took for the U.S. to get involved in the war, which I sort of had never really felt before, but I really felt there. Um, so having history to sort of hang the novel on made the novel easier to write, because I, I knew what was happening inside and outside. But you, you then, and this is maybe not a fair question, but do you feel a responsibility of the historical narrative to yeah. be true to it? Yeah. As so much at what possible. point are you, as much as possible, though, but where, where, do you, where does that end? Where I make mistakes, <laughs> which I definitely did. Um, for instance, I called a, trans, a crystal radio a transistor radio, and I got like 14 emails from about that, like within a week and a half of the book's publication, which means that there's like a really big transistor radio group Venn diagram, like, like literary fiction people and transistor radio people and then people who will email you about that and, and they all found me. You know, I mean, what I mean is like, and then my son finally, I was so distraught by all this and then my son, who was like 15 at this point, when I, I read yet another one, I was like, I don't know, even know what to say to the transistor radio people and he took the book, my computer, he's like, may I? I was like, sure, and he wrote, dear sir, it was a sir, dear sir, uh, I'm so sorry this is what you took from this book, yours, Lauren. And I was like, oh. <laughs> we do not treat readers like that. It's like, we do now. So, um, so, so, so I felt an absolute 
um, almost pa sometimes paralyzing uh, responsibility to the text and the history, not the text, to the history. Well, the text of the archive. I felt terrified of making mistakes. I double and triple checked everything. I no, but I still made mistakes because I'm human, and uh, you know, I, I I got so many small things wrong that I went back to Poland and I called my editor from Poland, like, you have to change this and you have to change this. And I'm talking about, like, directions or, you know, something is east and not north or I, I misspelled something, but uh, I was terrified, much more so than in any other novel, of getting it wrong because, because to get it wrong would be to dishonor the people who really suffered. So as historians, we're really all very concerned about chronological narrative, as my uh, students in the audience can, you know, or, or chronological progression. And yet, the novel, there's a chronology to it, and, but it doesn't necessarily adhere to the chronology of, of the ghetto, not exactly in place. So, I'm, so that's something that you're aware of. Um, I'm thinking specifically of information that the ghetto inhabitants would have had versus what you portrayed them to have at certain times. Yeah, yeah there are some things that, that I read enough sources that seemed a little, like I felt like I could pick the fuzziest <laughs> you know, information if it, if it uh, helped me write a plot. So sometimes there were things that, like, maybe they might have known, maybe they wouldn't. I'll just say that they would have known this, because it really helps. Yeah. So one last question, and we'll open it up to everybody else. Um, so, so what do you hope readers take away from this novel? Uh, that every human life, I mean, this is so, it sounds so um, elementary, but I, every, every um, human life is, is, contains a universe, right? And that they must, all of us must protect human life at all costs. I, that, that, that the loss of one person is, you know, is, is not just devastating for that one person, it's devastating for the whole fabric of humanity. So I, uh, you know, I, I try to write a book that celebrates life as much as possible. Yeah. And actually, yeah, I'm thinking of the Schindler's List then in the story, right? He who uh, saves the life saves the world. Right, right? exactly. So, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, I, I could go on asking questions, but there's probably people out there who want to ask some questions, so I'm going to say thank you and uh, yeah. turn it over to... Yes, thank you so much. It was just really amazing. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? I know. Someone needs to break the ice. You say oh. they're only... Oh, sorry. Lauren, thank you so much. It's such a great book. And it's really wonderful to hear you talk about it. Um, you said the only responsibility you have is to the story. Can you expand on that just for a second? Yeah. Or two? Sure. I mean, I, I feel, you know, when I teach undergrads, often they want to use a story to tell, teach a moral or teach a lesson, or they want to tell a story so that other people can relate, or they want to tell a story to make people feel better, or you know that the, there are agendas beyond what what the story requires. But as soon as you start imposing that onto fiction, the fiction almost not always, but almost always suffers because you're making choices like a character behaves in a way a character this character wouldn't really behave to try to teach a lesson. Or you're making people, you're sanding down the edges of your human being, the people that should seem human on the page, to make everything relatable. And so every choice that I make, I really try to make just to make the story as good as possible, as readable as possible, as interesting as possible. And um, of course, you know, you fudge things all the time. I remember in a novel I wrote someone made some joke about what to expect when you're expecting and I had to take it out because my publisher also published what to expect when you're expecting, right? You, you, you have to make adjustments, but generally speaking, I try to just make the choices that fit the story and not any other agenda. So when you, when you, um, I mean characters are important, moving the narrative along is important. Um, this is probably a real naive question, but is there some kind of formula? Like you know when the characters have to take over from the description, for example, or yeah, so. how to use dialogue? And, and yeah, I think, I think you need periods of rest in a novel, right? So like action, 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 action kind of gets both exhausting and kind of it's hard to keep everything straight. 
So I like to have periods of rest. I like to have my characters reflect. I, I'll, let me, I'll read a page, and then you can, um, but, but, yeah, and say stuff while I'm with the page. <laughs> <laughs> So anybody who's ever done any kind of research of a topic knows that it takes a while to become really familiar at it. And, and having uh, grown up in the profession of historians now for 30 plus years, I've watched people struggle with never thinking they have it right. And so I marvel at a person, a novelist, who in a relatively short period of time becomes not only knowledgeable, but really, really, really detailed knowledge of the Warsaw Ghetto and the you know, things that, and people that... It's it's impressive. I, I I would love to hear more about that at some point. How you how you manage to get up to speed so quickly? But just about almost nothing. You know, I know <laughs> like very deep, very narrow. Yeah. So I can tell you a lot about a little. All right, I'm going to read you a little bit of this book. This is from Adam, and it comes towards the end of the book. But since it's the Holocaust, we know what happens. I will admit, and this is a rest, Sarah, that's why I'm writing this, like, like, this is what I mean by a rest, right? So there's been action, 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 and then we need the character to sort of reflect. And I think that, that doing that allows a reader to reflect as well. So this is just a period of rest. I will admit that as I have collected testimonies from this archive, I have not always understood what the point of the archive was, or I've seen it in the mildest of terms, that the Onik Shabbat group has been creating a collective portrait of Polish Jews at this peculiar moment in our history, so that we remember what really happened, inscribing the truth of what we went through so that liberation wouldn't erase our memories. But now I realize that we are creating a portrait of Polish Jews at the end of our history, not one peculiar moment, but the very last moment. It is yet another surprise that it has taken me so long to understand that. When this is over, there will be no more of us. Even among the survivors, should there be any survivors, there will be no more of us. Does it matter if I write of our thousand year history on this land? If I write of the culture we have created? The literature, the theater, the science, the economies, the mutual aid societies, the customs, the friendships, the discoveries, the paintings, the newspapers, the cemeteries. It will all be gone, ground into the dust. I'm watching it now out my window, being ground to dust under the wheels of the Nazis' trucks. And as I watch, I find myself thinking of all things about language. Although it has its roots as a West Germanic language, English has stolen words and spellings and grammatical constructs from so many languages from around the world, pajama from Hindi, alcohol from Arabic. What was once a minor language spoken on a remote island is now the language of the most powerful nation in the world with a vocabulary to suit, bayonet, blockade, bulwark. I love English for this reason, for its mutability, its ability to change and survive. I love it for its forward momentum. I love it for its willingness to compromise and be stronger for it. And of course, I love Polish. The language I started learning as a child, the language in which I conducted the day-to-day -day business of my happy life. This was the language my father used to speak with me, the language of the country he died for. Polish is the language in which I earned my money and paid my taxes and slept with my wife. But I want to tell you that the first language I ever heard was Yiddish. Whispered in endearments from my mother, Bobola and Neshama. When we were babies, when we were very young boys, Yiddish was the only language in the world and it was entirely a language of sweetness and home. My thoughts, rid of any ability to imagine my fellow man, now turn only toward Yiddish as I watch the German trucks crush our streets and our people under their wheels. If I somehow manage to leave this place, I will conduct the rest of my life in English, or in Polish, or in French, or in Hebrew, or even, God forbid, in German. And if I die, my Yiddish will die with me. Will anyone miss or remember it? Will anyone miss or remember me? Nine, nine, nine. So that, that is both a way to, sorry, so that is both a way for him to reflect on what's happening, to report on what's happening, he's looking out at the window, but also to, to give a moment sort of an analysis or something, if that makes sense, or to sort of provide an overview of everything that is happening and the, and the broader loss, whereas an action scene is really just usually about one character at a time. So I find that, yeah, there is sort of a formula, I can't exactly get, get tell you what it is, maybe like two-thirds two -thirds action, one-third rest, but without those periods of reflection, the novel doesn't really gel, I think. <laughs>